Uh, thanks for this opportunity today. Um, I never thought about it that I was paving away. I just wanted to get together with my friends and, and drink and talk about security. And there just happened to be microphones there. So uh, some really great things happened as a result. And uh, it's fun to still sit around with my friends and drink and talk about security. Um, my, uh, my day job is I work for a company called Eclipsium. I'm the principal security evangelist. I will not try and sell you anything today. Today is all about looking at the firmware inside of your PC servers and laptops, specifically using open source tools, um, which has been uh, a lot of fun. And so one of the places where I like to start is by, you know, asking a question is how many like devices are inside your devices. Sometimes we phrase that question of how many CPUs do you think are in your laptop or your desktop computer? I think it's important to understand the different types of firmware, where firmware might live that you're looking at. So obviously there's IoT devices um, where I, I started a lot talking about firmware on WRT54G routers. Um, one of the reasons I... I love working for Eclipsium is they they tackle the firmware problem specifically in one major area, and that is the firmware that lives inside your PC servers and laptops. There's lots of different uh, types of firmware, and it turns out there's a, a lot of like devices inside your devices. Um, if you were to look at your laptop, let's say, um, you've got everything from your main CPU. You've got another chipset if you're using an Intel-based computer that was built after uh, 2006 or later. You have Intel ME uh, in some form inside of your computer, which basically means you've got uh, CPU, some dedicated RAM, uh, and it shares storage with the spy flash that we'll talk about uh, a lot in this presentation. Um, so that's built into your computer. So there's literally a computer inside your computer. Um, your network cards have firmware. Uh, your baseband management controllers or BMCs. Um, it, ME has some of those components. And of course, on servers, you've seen things like ILO and DRAC from uh, major manufacturers, which is, uh, again, a computer inside your computer for, for managing your computer. Um, you've got your BIOS or UEFI, which is largely where we will focus on today. Um, the UEFI became popular in 2011 to replace BIOS uh, as the mechanism that initializes hardware and uh, begins to boot up your operating system. You've also got some embedded controllers, specifically, for example, if you've got a laptop, you have um, most likely some EC firmware that can live either on its own chip or on the spy flash, there's a couple of different ways in which uh, that can be present there. Uh, but your EC firmware on a laptop typically controls your keyboard, your uh, monitor, the brightness, the function keys to change the brightness, power of the system on and off. Uh, that's actually all controlled by an embedded controller that runs firmware. Of course, your RAM and hard drives also have firmware and your memory controller. We'll talk about that a little bit. One that's actually missing from here, it's it, it, pseudo kind of firmware based depends on the implementation uh, is your chipset, uh, which is also your PCH platform controller hub is the technical term. We typically call it a chipset. If you ever built a PC, for example, you may have looked at which chipset uh, is it running, uh, which is basically a central hub for a lot of your components to attach to, to allow you to communicate with those particular components. So there's a lot going on inside of your computer. Um, after working for Eclipsium and digging into this stuff for some time, uh, everything that happens from the time you turn the power button on to the time you log into the system, like I'm amazed that that works at all today with all the di different pieces and components. Um, a great talk by two of my coworkers, amazing security researchers and just some of the nicest people um, that I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Mickey and Jesse are amazing. They gave a talk back in 2015 called The Hidden Dangers Inside the Platform and talked about how you could potentially hide malware and other things inside of some of these uh, components. So I put the link uh, there to that talk, which I thought was one of uh, some of their best talks. When we start talking about UEFI firmware, right, again, that's software that's responsible for hardware initial initialization and booting your computer, 
the one of the most popular questions that I've gotten since I started working at Eclipsium and evangelizing uh, this problem of you, if I firm were being vulnerable, is well, Paul, show me some real world attacks. So essentially, this slide and that blog post represent um, the somewhat complete. There, you could you know, depends on how you define a firmware attack and, and all of that stuff. These are very much uh, a list of endpoint based, uh, UEFI based, except for the first one, which was uh, 2011 before UEFI became very, very popular. Um, and so these are largely, again, endpoint and UEFI based uh, attacks that is malware that has had the cap- has the capability to attack uh, vulnerabilities or misconfigurations in UEFI firmware. Uh, and I wrote a post on this. It, it you know lists them all out in this pretty little chart, and it gives you links to all the different resources. If you're ever kind of curious about what each of these particular pieces of malware are doing, I do highly recommend uh, reading the um, secure list post on Cosmic Strand to get a really good sense of how a boot kit works. It is extremely detailed in all the different things that it's hooking in the boot process to uh, accomplish a full compromise of the operating system uh, via that mechanism. Uh, It's probably on that list, the best explanation of what we call a boot kit or malware that's infecting UEFI uh, and particularly the boot process uh, that's involved. Black Lotus is very interesting. Black Lotus is something is uh, an exploit kit or UEFI boot kit, as it were, that is was for sale on an exploit market. Um, several different security researchers have observed this being sold. To my knowledge, the reason it's unconfirmed is I, I have not been able to either talk to a researcher or myself, look at the actual software that was being sold uh, for about $5,000, claiming to have um, a full kit that can exploit a bootloader and implant malware inside of UEFI and or the bootloader. Um, So there there are some articles that were written about that, uh, which kind of gave me the luxury uh, of talking about it a bit. Uh, so you can find my post firmware attacks um, in endpoint timeline and, and read about all this different malware that can infect UEFI software. Before we go forward, um, just a note: like we probably most of you have had to do something with updating your BIOS uh, or other firmware uh, at some point uh, in your technology journey, and so before you. Um, take on any of the other defensive mechanisms that I talk about in this talk, um, or even just start looking at your BIOS um, or UEFI firmware, it's always good as a first step to update your BIOS or UEFI version to the latest version. Um, That There's so many different things that uh, could go wrong, so many different uh, dependencies. There's... um, issues as I highlight there. If you're doing things like updating secure boot on your system, make sure that you update your UEFI BIOS before you do that because it could contain bugs. And we don't want to have anyone breaking their systems, right? And I don't want to be responsible for anyone breaking their systems. So use all of the things that I explained here today with extreme caution not a first running them on your production systems and things of that nature. Um, so you can, like in Linux, and I've got links to all their operating systems, check to see which BIOS version um, that you're running. And um, you can do that on Linux with the DMI decode commands, get your BIOS version, your, bio, your BIOS release date, go check that and apply your BIOS update. So this... Um, Presentation is kind of broken up into three parts. Um, we'll talk about Secure Boot. We'll talk about Intel ME uh, or their management engine technology. And we'll talk about protecting your spy flash, which is where your UEFI uh, BIOS is stored, uh, among other things. So first, we'll start with Secure Boot. And you know this presentation flow actually follows a three-part blog post series that I put up on Eclipsium, largely all using open source tools um, to look at these various aspects of your firmware. It's all out there for free. Um, This presentation is actually slightly updated version of some of the stuff that's in uh, the blog posts. 
So for those not familiar with Secure Boot, um, it's a lot of fun and a great topic. Uh, it gets pretty nerdy. It also gets somewhat philosophical. We get to talk about things like who do we trust? Why do we trust them? Which software do we trust in the boot process? And who is validating that trust? And um, it starts with the secure boot, um, basically PKI structure um, that was created. And in this example, and in this context of this presentation, I'm talking about UEFI secure boot. So the defined standard from UEFI that uh, has defined secure boot. There's other forms of secure boot. Uh, ARM has a completely different process for secure boot. Different processor architectures, different hardware, different devices that don't use UEFI may have their own secure boot process. Um, but in this context, I'm speaking specifically to UEFI secure boot. Um, so it starts out with a hierarchy. It starts off with um, the platform manufacturer's key or the platform key or PK, um, which is typically uh, a certificate issued by the hardware manufacturer. So if you have an ASUS motherboard, uh, chances are the platform key will be issued by ASUS. The next key in the hierarchy is the key exchange key. And the key exchange key can actually be multiple keys. So typically, and I'll show you how to look at this on your systems, the key exchange key could be one from Microsoft and it could be one from Canonical if you're running Ubuntu. Um, and these key exchange keys uh, are, of course, trusted by the, the previous key hierarchy but these keys are used to validate what we call the DB and the DBX. Um, and these are uh, authorized lists of hashes uh, and or certificates that um, are either validating or invalidating software that is used in the boot process. Um, so we'll talk about DB and DBX uh, a, a little more. Um, so like I said, your platform key is typically um, from that single vendor or OEM its primary job is to verify the key exchange keys. Um, also uh, interesting to note, when we talk about secure boot and we have these four different elements uh, that are listed on this slide, these elements are UEFI variables. They're stored in NVRAM inside of the spy flash in the region that where your UEFI BIOS is stored. Don't worry if that, that was like a lot <laughs> to take in all at once. I'll cover uh, towards the end of the presentation uh, the spy flash layout, uh, exactly how that's laid out. Um, for this part, keep in mind that PK, KEK, the DB, and the DBX are variables that can hold multiple values. So inside of your key exchange key variable can be multiple keys, um, and those keys are used to uh, validate and sign the authorized list of hashes and or certificates um, that are associated with software that has been validated for secure boot. So the Windows bootloader, for example, has a particular hash that hashes in the DB as being authorized um, to boot your operating system. When there are vulnerabilities and or other issues found, someone loses a key, someone introduces a vulnerability inside of a bootloader, that vulnerability allows an attacker to potentially or usually bypass the secure boot process. What will happen is that hash of that software, like Grub, for example, will be put into the DBX. When your system is booting with secure boot, one of the first things that it does, at least it should do if the developers follow the spec, is check the DBX and make sure that uh, the software that is being used in secure boot has not been revoked. So the DBX is a revocation list. Uh, and it will check that first um, uh, in order to update the DB or DBX, right? You have to have a valid key exchange key. So that DB and DBX uh, is protected within the PKI uh, infrastructure. Um, so I mentioned Grub as an example, um, and it was actually Eclipsium researchers that discovered um, a couple of different vulnerabilities in Grub 2. And these vulnerabilities were essentially in the configuration files. You could put data that was then parsed by Grub and triggered a um, 
uh, a buffer overflow, in fact, in Grub, which would allow you to bypass the secure boot process. And what happened was we figured out what all those different versions of Grub are that were vulnerable. Um, we issued an update to the DBX and we said everyone has to go update their DBX so that if you're booting with secure boot and it tries to boot your system and you have a vulnerable version of Grub, secure boot will go, I am not booting that system because the hash of your version of Grub is in the DBX. Uh, and actually, Eclipse didn't release a tool to check that on your system to see if you have what we call the boot hole uh, vulnerability. Uh, and there's links to resources there. So that is an example of kind of the secure boot revocation process, which we could talk about probably for the entire hour, how that might be broken or not broken uh, and whose responsibility is it. Essentially, you get the Spider-Man meme where all the spider mans are pointing at each other. Whose job is it to revoke the certificate? Whose job is it to apply the revocation? Um, and you get like a bunch of vendors and administrators pointing fingers at each other. Um, so one of the first things to do, you know, on your systems is to verify that secure boot is enabled. Now it has to be enabled in your UEFI um, BIOS. Um, it also has to be enabled within your operating system as well. And here are some commands that you can use to determine if secure boots enabled or not. Um, on Linux, I like to use mockutil, um, which has a lot of other different features and functionality uh, that kind of go beyond the, the scope here. Um, uh, MOK or, or mock is machine owner key. So I, you know, I, I should have said in the earlier slides when we talked about the PK, uh, the Keck, DB, and DBX, that you can generate your own PKI infrastructure, all of your own certificates, uh, and you do that with the mock utilities or machine owner key uh, in you know, on Linux. So you can do it yourself. Now, you're responsible for signing all the software in your boot process, so when you get a new kernel, you're going to have to sign that with your key uh, and, and do the validation and, and issuing of the key and updating of the, of the DB. Uh, on your own. For me, that's like way too much uh, maintenance and uh, administration. So you can also check in on Windows uh, using uh, some uh, PowerShell commands as well. So that's a check. Make sure Secure Boot is enabled. Now, when we get into like what's in those variables, um, when I started learning about Secure Boot, I was like, wow, like what certificates are in the the uh, you know key hierarchy on my system like i need to know this i need to make sure that a certificate from microsoft is in my key exchange key variable if i want to go download a dbx update from uefi that has to be signed by a certificate that's in my key exchange key variable. So I want to know like what's in my key exchange key variable, what's in my PK, who's the, the platform key and who whose certificate does that belong to? So these commands right here, you can run on your system. You can use these commands to read from NVRAM, which is stored in your spy flash, the UEFI variables that represent the key hierarchy and uh, authorization and revocation lists. Um, and then convert it into a more readable format where you can then start looking at who issued these certificates. And you can see on one of my systems, this all makes sense to me, right? I think a, a lot of what we need to do in security is like investigate things and ask ourselves, does this make sense? I have an Asus motherboard, which means my platform key was issued by Asus. I'm like, that's cool. Uh, if I look at my key exchange key, I can see I've got one that was issued by Microsoft in their third-party marketplace, so the third-party CA. That is, if I make software like a bootloader, I go to Microsoft and I say, hey, I want to be involved in the secure boot process. Someone along the way decided that Microsoft would be the gatekeeper for this. Microsoft asks me some questions. Basically, am I going to protect my private key? Then grants me the ability to sign software that can participate in secure boot um, through Microsoft's third-party uh, CA secure boot certificate chain. Canonical also has a certificate in there so that we can boot Linux software. Um, that's probably uh, beyond the scope. But basically, uh, the various Linux distributions at a very high level created one small piece of software called Shim. Microsoft signs Shim 
Shim is responsible for loading the second stage bootloader, which is typically Grub or or some other kind of Linux bootloader. Um, so this was a, a, a good way, I think, to one, reduce your attack surface, minimize the code um, that has to be signed, responsible for secure boot, and allow all the Linux distributions to more easily participate in secure boot. Okay, so one of the things is when software involved in the secure boot process is vulnerable and needs to be revoked, that means your DBX revocation list, if it, as it were, has to be updated. So the question that I had was, well, how do I know if my DBX is out of date? Is this is this a vulnerability scanner? Is this an EDR? Is this my Linux distribution? Is this Microsoft? And again, you get a bunch of Spider-Mans pointing at each other going, no, it's your problem. It's your problem. So I'm like, I took it upon myself to go, how do I figure out if my DBX is out of date, right? And your mileage is going to vary. Um, Mac OS is Apple takes care of all that for you. And you have to trust that Apple is going to take care of that for you. Microsoft, it depends on which hardware that you're running on the Surface platform. Microsoft is taking care of all that for you because they, they control the hardware. Uh, on Linux, it's kind of up to you, although things are getting better. Um, when I originally did this research, when I started at Eclipsium, um, I wrote up this really uh, kind of nerdy way that I hacked together and I think it was one of the first people to publish this particular method for updating your DBX. Um, and it worked and people loved it. It was great. We all rejoiced. And to my, I, I haven't tested this recently, but this should still work on your systems. I tested it on Ubuntu 20.04. Um, so, you know, your mileage may vary, but you could use this if you wanted to on a test system. And don't blame Paul if you create a brick. Um, a much better way to do this is to use the LVFS project on Linux. This is the Linux vendor firmware service. Um, you can use this software on Linux to evaluate the state of your DBX. Richard Hughes is the author of LVFS and has built into this software very recently the ability for you to use LVFS on your Linux systems to update the DBX. Now, LVFS can do a lot of other things like update firmware on all different components, and that's limited to vendors who are participating in the LVFS uh, infrastructure and ecosystem. So um, what I discovered is that, like, wow, I'm out of date on the DBX on all of my systems and i'm a really bad security person because my dbx is out of date and i did this by doing uh fw update manager which is the lvfs command to get your devices one of the things it looks at is the dbx and it told me that it was out of date and i was like wow i, I really i should really update that um and lvfs now can do this for you um provided your one i believe 1.85 or above uh, I'm not sure if previous versions of 1.8 had this functionality, but on Linux, make sure using the command on this slide, fwupd manager dash dash version, um, make sure you're 1.85. Issue the command to LVFS to get updates, get dash updates. And uh, that will update the, the databases of all the different firmware and uh, other updates for uh, fwupd manager. And once you've done that, you can run a command, FW Manager Update, and it will update the DBX or the revocation list for secure boot for you and do that really well. I've tested it on a whopping three systems. Richard tells me that um, I think over a million people since this feature was released have updated their DBXs. Now, I don't know if they were successful or not, um, but he, he has shared uh, data. I should have put the slide in here, too. I have the data from the LVFS because um, Richard's an awesome guy um, that since this feature was released, more people are updating their GBX. And Paul rejoices because this this is like the nerdy stuff that uh, I get excited about. So my advice is first, update your firmware, then for whatever operating system and particular hardware you have, make sure that you research that first and apply your DBX updates. Again, that may be happening for you, um, but use caution if your UEFI BIOS is not up to date, particularly in a Windows environment, Microsoft has had a heck of a time. There's been lots of bugs. Um, a recent um, uh, DBX update 
that resulted in uh, recent research actually from Mickey and Jesse. They found vulnerabilities in bootloaders that forced everyone to update their DBX. Microsoft pushed that out over the summer. And for a certain percentage of, of uh, computers, Windows computers, uh, it triggered a, a BitLocker uh, key uh, refresh. So if you've got 50,000 systems and 10,000 people have the issue, they're calling the help desk to get BitLocker uh, recovery keys. Uh, if they don't have them already. So make sure you do research it. Were there questions on Secure Boot? Uh, there is a question in there. Are those being validated against CA certs that are from OpenSSL? Uh, no, they're being, uh, actually, it's a great question. They're being validated from CA certs that um, are distributed either from uh, your OEM hardware manufacturer or if it's a third-party cert through Microsoft or like Microsoft uh, themselves. So the certificate validation is manufacturer and or OEM uh, specific. Uh, they are not the same, it's not the same uh, CA certs that we would use like when you install CA dash certificates in a, a Linux system. Uh, it is not that, it's a different uh, PKI infrastructure. Good question. Um, so let's talk about Intel ME. Speaking of having computers in your computers, um, it's kind of frightening. Like Intel ME uh, really is a computer inside your computer. Um, it, again, this is another topic we could spend a whole bunch of time on. There's a lot to unpack here. However, um, Intel ME was introduced in 2006. It is in basically, as far as I know, every Intel-based computer since 2006 it is now called the intel csme converged security and manageability engine it does have its own cpu and sram it has its own microkernel which has changed uh over time it used to be an arc based processor coincidentally which also shares lineage with a super nes uh processor from the same company uh, they did eventually switch it to an x86 based uh, processor at, at some point in time. I believe that's documented in, in the blog post that I link to. Uh, for storage, it stores it on the SPY flash. So your SPY flash chip is typically where your UEFI BIOS is stored, Intel ME is stored, as well as some other things that I'll go through towards the end. Um, and that's typically on most x86 and a lot of different computing platforms. There is a SPY uh, flash chip that uses the SPY protocol. Um, to store firmware and other configuration data. That is where, in fact, the firmware for Intel ME lives. Um, it introduces this ring level three access. So the hardware and software that makes up uh, Intel ME is has full direct access to all of the hardware on your computer before the operating system and even before UEFI or SMM system management mode. It is like the most privileged code and really hardware that lives on your system. And it does that because its goal is to provide manageability so you can have offline uh, access. There is a feature of Intel ME called AMT, Active Management Technology. If that's included in your ME firmware, Active management technology acts like a BMC. It acts like a web management interface, for example, that allows administrators offline to go rebuild computers. And if you're doing that, it needs direct access to all of your hardware to rebuild your hard drive, to do update your BIOS. It plays a role in some of the security mechanisms inside of your computer um, such as uh, manufacturing mode. ME is one of the things that's involved with um, setting initial configuration settings or keys and setting field programmable fuses on your hardware. So ME plays a very important role. Um, there's ways to sort of disable it that I go through in uh, the, the blog post. Um, but more today, I want to talk about some of the vulnerabilities that it's had. There's some amazing research that's been done over the years into Ring 3 rootkits and security issues in Intel ME. And that's all linked to in my blog post. If you want to go read, pretty much I think I've captured every single research paper that was ever written and presentation on Intel ME. So you can go read those. 
what I'll focus on today is trying to find the ways to detect Intel ME on your system and make sure that it's up to date. And I, I won't cover it here, but you can go and try and like basically neuter or disable Intel ME. Um, you very high likelihood that you could create a brick on your system. Um, depending on how deep you go, you may also need specialized hardware uh, in a spy programmer, um, such as, oh, I just had one too. Um, a bus pirate will do it. There's lots of different things that will do it. Um, so like, I, I don't really recommend that. Uh, what I recommend is use these utilities to scan for the presence of Intel ME and uh, see if it has any vulnerabilities, and then just keep it updated on your system. Um, so this is uh, Silent Bob is Silent was actually a, a, a nickname for a vulnerability in the active management technology component discovered in 2007 um, that had an authentication bypass. So anyone could basically manage your system. Um, which would be bad. That was Intel Security Advisory 00075. Um, and there are tools uh, such as this one that can detect if your ME is vulnerable to that particular vulnerability. And if it is, that's really bad, by the way. Uh, you, you don't want an authentication bypass on your AMT because that would be bad. Basically, it would allow the world to manage your uh, hardware at ring minus three level access. Uh, Intel's manufacturing mode is, again, when um, this very complex supply chain uh, happens when you they're putting together your computer, right? Intel provides the CPU. Um, you've got um, someone like AMI providing the UEFI BIOS, or maybe it's inside. Then you've got like an OEM, like maybe it's Asus, Dell, or HP, or Lenovo, that's taking hardware and software from Intel and hardware and software from inside or AMI and maybe something from Realtek. And it's putting all of this together. When it gets to that OEM manufacturer, the uh, you know, that Purism post is a, a good one on Intel uh, ME as well. It's a great write-up. When the OEM puts it together, they've got to add some customizations. They may add their own keys and not just uh, for secure boot, but other keys involved in different aspects of Intel boot guard uh, and, and other mechanisms, usually for Intel boot guard. And they'll actually take a, a, a key and put it on a uh, field programmable fuse. And there's hardware-based and software-based uh, FPFs as well. And it can do that because it's in, man it's in uh, manufacturing mode. So it allows the OEM to do kind of those final steps in configuration. What they're supposed to do is then turn manufacturing mode off, which fuses all the keys and locks uh, a lot of that configuration, not all of it, but locks uh, most of it into place. Well, as it turns out, some manufacturers or OEMs, I should say, um, forget or don't want to go through the trouble of turning off manufacturing mode, which means me as the attacker, I can go in and finish the configuration for you. I can fuse my own keys onto your hardware so that you always trust me and not Intel or your OEM. Um, and that would be bad. There's also theories that we could uh, permanently damage hardware uh, if you're uh, flipping some of these fuses uh, and setting uh, weird values and then flipping a fuse. So like, it's really bad. And Apple actually had this vulnerability. Apple shipped Intel-based Macs in manufacturing mode for a certain period of time uh, and, and eventually uh, fixed it, uh, thankfully. Um, but yeah, so manufacturing mode is a thing. What's weird is I still, it's just the, uh, I think I have a, an example. I still find PCs that I bought about a year ago that never flipped manufacturing mode. I'm like, how is this still possible? I think the larger manufacturers gotten better, your Dell, HP, Lenovo. Um, but you start dipping outside of that. I've personally found systems and I'm like, they never flipped manufacturing mode. That's bad. And that's not always something that you can do yourself. Matthew Garrett has a great check uh, to see if AMT is enabled. It's slightly older, um, but it does still work. Um, Chipsec is an open source project that was born out of Intel. Uh, many of my coworkers at Eclipsium uh, and founders 
worked on Shipsec while they were at Intel and was kind of the inspiration for creating uh, the company that I work for today. Chipsec is fully open source. It's on GitHub. If you're installing it on uh, Ubuntu, specifically 20.04, those instructions should work really well. If you're installing it on a different Linux distribution, uh, it might change slightly, um, but those are the basics of how to install it. One of the so once you get Chipsec installed, one of the things that Chipsec can do is look to see if your Intel ME is in manufacturing mode. Um, now it's interesting when I ran it on the system, it tells me that it's in manufacturing mode. Um, so Chipsec has multiple different modules. One of them is ME manufacturing mode, um, and I ran just that module and showed me that this system, uh, I forget which system that is, um, uh, one of the systems that I manage, uh, they had never flipped uh, manufacturing mode, which is bad. You can also, uh, Core Boot is an open source UEFI implementation. Um, it has a tool within Core Boot called Intel ME tool that can be used to query your Intel ME settings to get the firmware version and other settings and features within Intel ME. Um, it's, it's, a little, it's a little unstable. Um, if you can get it to work, uh, it, it tends to work pretty well, but it, it's got some issues. Um, I was able to get it running on uh, a few of my systems, and it does more than just report the version or manufacturing mode, right? It produces some of the other modules and configuration uh, that was in Intel ME. But perhaps the best tool actually comes from Intel, uh, and they make this, I believe, for Windows and Linux systems. Um, and running this tool from Intel, this is the CSME version detection tool, will give you a really accurate uh, version that, of Intel ME you're running and tell you if you're vulnerable to any known vulnerabilities that or, or missing patches that have come from Intel for Intel ME. It doesn't tell you specifically uh, what some of those CVEs are, um, but it does tell you that uh, your ME is out of date and you should follow your OEM's recommendations. So if I have an Asus motherboard, I don't go to Intel to get my Intel ME software. I have to go to Asus to get my ME software because there's uh, certificates and or keys involved in that for your hardware. And there's hardware specific things that your OEM has done. So always get your ME from, you have to basically get it from your OEM manufacturer, such as I have an ASUS motherboard, I get mine from ASUS. Um, and again, my advice to deal with these issues in Intel ME is to make sure that you update your firmware. So make sure your UEFI is up to date. Then that's always the first step because oftentimes if you go update Intel ME on your system, it's going to tell you to make sure that you've updated your UEFI BIOS first. Um, so make sure that you do UEFI update first, then go see if you have ME on your system using the commands I showed here, and then go find through your OEM uh, the updated version of ME. And then if you're running Linux, you have to go off and build like a Windows bootable USB drive to apply the updates in most uh, cases. So usually the ME update uh, software is written in Windows. Um, and it, it can, I don't think I ever found a way to do it directly in, in Linux, uh, unless you're disabling it, which again, I cover in my blog post. I kind of don't recommend it. Okay, um, questions on ME. All right, if I missed any questions, just let me know, ask them again. I'll pause again at the end for questions uh, as well. We definitely don't want to brick a device when we're updating firmware. We hope, we hope that we don't. Uh, if you follow my advice of getting your updates from sources that you've researched and verify that it's for your hardware, you should have good luck. Okay, so your... You, EFI, among other software that's involved with your system, is installed on your spy flash chip. You know, some of you that do, um, we just actually last night uh, interviewed Blenster, um, who runs uh, soldering seminars and has designed badges. Um, some of your, a lot of your components that make up a badge, you might see at a conference that has all flashing lights. Um, a lot of the hardware uh, projects that you see have spy flash chips on them. Um, your motherboard inside your computer uh, 
uh, most computers have a spy flash chip, um, which is a flash chip that talks the spy protocol. Um, and it uh, basically serves as storage for very critical firmware and configuration for your system. Um, so your spy flash chip, again, soldered on your uh, motherboard. Uh, I wish I had a, a picture of it. I have a picture of the, that looks to be, a, that's a bus pirate um, with the cable that has a clip that can clip onto your spy flash chip. Uh, if you want to read and or write to it directly, which we talked about creating bricks, you, oftentimes you can recover it as long as you have the right software to recover your spy flash, uh, not software and configuration to write the, the appropriate uh, data to your spy flash. Um, so your spy flash, again, um, the OEM uh, is the one that's building that spy flash to begin with. They have various configuration options when they're uh, putting the software and configuration on the spy flash as to how it's protected. Uh, and those protection mechanisms uh, just a huge caveat here because it, I get, it gets really confusing. If I talk about specific features and configuration options that are specific to protecting the spy flash um, and specific to UEFI, the answer is always like it depends. Like put this huge asterisk in your mind that that might not be for your chipset. So a lot of these configuration variables have changed over time, and it depends on which version of the, the chipset that you have that maps back to an Intel data sheet that tells you exactly what each register represents, which configuration option that register ties back to, um, and what it, what it will do on your system. So, uh, and code has to be implemented in protected memory in order to read those configuration options. Um, so, the the high level of what I just said is you have to go back to your OEM to get updates to improve the security of your BIOS, right? You can't, even if you were to try to flip some of these bits on your own and change registers on your own, there may not be code loaded into memory in your BIOS that even is going to look at that flag. Um, so that was kind of the concerning part for me after I, I you know, researched how all this worked to write it up for the blog was you're really reliant on your upstream supply chain to give you a secure configuration. So some of those protection mechanisms rely on SMM mode in the processor system management mode, which actually halts operating system operations and is a very privileged mode uh, in uh, Intel x86-based processors um, to be able to do um, privileged operations such as update your UEFI BIOS, for example. Um, so um, the... Spy flash is broken out into regions, which we'll get to next. And each of those regions uh, have a specific purpose. And um, the first region in that, so let me show you the regions. Um, so this is how your spy flash is laid out. Um, the zero through, uh, you know, the uh, Fs of the address at, at the top, um, those are flash linear addresses. So these are uh, the uh, monikers used for the addressable space within your spy flash. And um, it's built similar to a file system where it's broken up into regions. Each of those regions have an offset. So uh, the flash descriptor will hold a table that says from zero to wherever the beginning of the flash descriptor is, there is a predefined size, depending on your chipset that escapes me. But it'll say from this point, uh, you know, from this offset zero to this other offset, that's where your flash descriptor lives, right? And then the flash descriptor contains a map. It says the next region is your BIOS region. And it has this flash linear address to this flash linear address is defined as your BIOS region. Then there's a region for Intel uh, ME or CSME. There's a region for Intel Gigabit Ethernet, which is usually configuration for your Gigabit Ethernet. Um, there's a, an EC region, which is your embedded controller, which can contain either firmware or configuration data for your embedded controller. And then there's platform data, which the best I can tell right now is configuration data uh, for your platform. The flash descriptor is um, not only contains a map, 
uh, that says where each of these regions are and their offsets, but also controls permissions. It says that this region is writable. This region is not writable. So one of the interesting attacks is, um, and if the flash descriptor region itself is not protected, I can rewrite the permissions on the flash descriptor. Um, so uh, again, flash descriptor basically contains rules that protects the other regions from being written to. But if the OEM or manufacturer hasn't protected the flash descriptor region, I can basically rewrite the firewall rules, right? I mean, this is basically like you've allowed me to rewrite the firewall rules um, that open them up so that I can now write data to the other regions which should be protected. That's just one example uh, of a protection in a potential attack. Um, really quickly, because um, we're getting a little uh, tight on time, we could spend a lot of time talking about uh, how the spy flash is accessed. Um, so this is a, a simplified diagram. Um, it's also, again, like the answer is it depends. Like this varies from chipset to chipset and architecture to architecture. Generally, a pretty large uh, class of Intel-based uh, CPU architecture will be constructed like this, where your CPU is accessing your memory controller and, and then accessing the uh, protected region of RAM uh, called SM RAM or system management RAM. Inside of system management RAM um, is a specialized code that's loaded in there during your boot process, actually. Uh, the code that's loaded in there is for dealing with SMIs or system management interrupts. Um, uh, and that's loaded into, uh, into RAM and protected RAM. Um, your your code calls those particular SMI handlers. Those SMI handlers map to your ICH or your PCH, which is your chipset, um, which has a spy controller on it. Um, and that spy controller and SMI handlers know how to communicate to each other and then pass your request to read or write off to the spy flash. Um, so that's how communication uh, is done. If you're really interested in this subject, I highly recommend... Uh, Zeno Kova's training. He's got some at opensecuritytraining.info, which is where I got the basis for this diagram from. Uh, also, if you Google for open source, uh, open security training two, uh, he has a bunch of free modules. One of them is understanding UEFI. Uh, and it's what I use to learn enough that I could actually ask intelligent questions uh, to my coworkers who have done this for over 10 years. Uh, so that's my that's my cheat and my hack to how to come up on UEFI very quickly. Uh, search for open security training two. Zeno Kova has uh, free training. Okay. Um, what I uncover with there's and there's more like there's a lot more uh, to this, but general principles are um, there are four different ways to protect your spy flash because if an attacker can write to your spy flash and bypass these protections, that means they could implant code uh, at some point very, very early in the boot process or in the platform initialization process, which is before well before any protections are loaded, certainly by the operating system and even other components in hardware uh, and software. So that's why it's important to protect your spy flash. The first one I've already described is your flash descriptor. Um, then you've got global write protections. There's BIOS range write protections, which you can um, protect certain ranges by address um, from being written to. And then once you do that, you have to actually lock the flash configuration down which is similar to manufacturing mode, but is actually something completely different. But another step that your OEM has to do to say, I don't want these regions to be written to um, and put the configuration in, and then it has to lock that configuration. Um, so well, one thing to do with Chipsec is to use Chipsec to read your spy flash. And it actually, in this case, it'll dump your entire spy flash, everything off of there, um, into a file uh, that you can parse. Uh, that it has routines that it parses through for you. Um, and so the first thing I do is I dump my spy flash, and then I can run commands against the dumped spy flash to determine how it's configured. One of the things you can see with this particular spy flash dump is region zero, the flash descriptor, 
is readable and writable, which goes back to I can write my own firewall rules and I can change it such that I can read and write to other regions. Now, the other regions in this particular case are also not write protected, so I wouldn't need to do that. But all bets are off if your Flash descriptor region is writable. So, uh, and that's how to check for this with the chipsec utility um, that is included with chipsec to see on your systems, is your spy flash writable? Is your flash descriptor region writable? Um, the next thing in my list was um, global write protections. And uh, I highly recommend that you go to my blog post um, and read the description there and read some of the resources there to truly understand it. Um, it gets really confusing because I like, get changes over time. So Intel, for example, released uh, features in the chipset that allow you to uh, lock and or write enable uh, to write stuff to the spy flash. They realized there were some insecurities with that. So you would send, uh, a, you would create an SMI handler, right? Which invokes code that talks to the spy controller, which then writes or reads from the spy flash. The configuration for that spy controller, it's all controlled in registers. And so you could tell the controller, basically set BIOS write enable. That means I want to write to the spy flash. Um, and also lock enable. So don't allow that uh, from happening. And there was a race condition, and you can read about that. And it was part of the operation for, for reading uh, and writing. One of the security protection mechanisms they implemented after those two features were introduced was called SMM BIOS write protection, which means you have to have enough privileges on the system to put the CPU in system management mode before you can make a request to go right to the spy flash and ultimately right to the spy flash. Um, so that was a protection. These have to be enabled. Like the OEM has to configure these to say that your computer must be in S your CPU must be in SMM mode before you can write to the BIOS. Um, and oftentimes manufacturers don't do that because there's a series of features that were introduced uh, over time. And it gets really confusing because the third protection mechanism from your spy flash is completely independent and basically um, breaks out what we call protected ranges. And those are flash linear addresses that you can define to say, hey, this region of the spy flash in between these two addresses guess what? That's protected. And you should never allow rights to this, but maybe allow rights to this. So it allows you some more finely grained control over which regions can be written to and which portions of each region uh, can be written to. Because to make matters more confusing, each region also has its own map um, uh, th that you can kind of dig into as well, which I didn't go into in this presentation. Um, so uh, the second one, BIOS range write protection, uh, should be configured by your OEM. The final thing is you have to lock down the flash configuration. You have to change a register to go, I want the flash configuration uh, to be set. Um, this can only be unset upon a platform reset. Uh, to your computer, which is either a reboot or a wake from sleep, and it's actually a specific CPU command. Um, but flash configuration lockdown has to be set in order for the BIOS range write protection that I described here to actually uh, take effect and stick. So again, oftentimes OEMs don't get this right. We talked about four different mechanisms in your spy flash. When I go out and I scan my systems and other systems that I manage for these particular things, um, I think every single one is missing at least one. I want to say my framework laptop was the best. Framework did the best job, um, as far as I could tell, of, of locking down the system, which also had Intel ME on it as well. Um, they got like my A for the day uh, in terms of l paying a lot of attention to this configuration. There's still like one or two things that could probably do better, um, but they did a really good job with it. And again, if you go to your system and you say, hey, I'm missing um, SMM BIOS write protection, you can't just go change that. I mean, you could write some code to go modify a register, right? 
get really down the hardware level, modify a register that tells your spy controller that your CPU must be in uh, system management mode in order to write the spy flash. However, if the software that's in protected memory, your SM handlers or your SMI handlers, if the code isn't in there that actually checks that particular register, it's not going to work, right? Or you could change that register and you could break your system, or you could cause some kind of software glitch. Um, All of these are interdependencies in hardware and firmware that the OEM has designed for your system that you likely can't change on your own. You have to go back to your OEM manufacturer and go, hey, you didn't enable SMM BIOS write protections. Can you give me a firmware update that enables that? Um, and they're probably going to be like, yeah, no, that's that's end of life. And I'm, I'm sorry, we can't we can't do that, especially if you're MSI. Um, so uh, make sure that you update the firmware again is my overarching uh, advice. So uh, I will take any questions. Um, that is my email address. If you have any questions, comments, want more information, just say hi, whatever. Send me an email. Hey, Paul. Great job. Hey, thanks. Hey, it reminded me of when I saw like the blockchain webcast that Bo did. And I was like, I don't understand any of this that well. I I went kind of fast. Uh, no, it's not of, you. Yeah, it's the, it's all there. new topics for me. It's all new terms. It's all new things. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, our, our researchers have uh, like a two and three day course that goes through all of this, mm-hmm. which I, I I went through the materials and then I went through Zeno's training class to be able to understand it, to explain it to other people. So it's, it's definitely uh, oddly specific, right? Yeah. Uh, question from the audience. How often would you recommend checking if your firmware is up to date? Um, every, every day. <laughs> um, I, I try and incorporate that in my uh, package management updates. So I try and check on my Linux systems if there's new software every day. Um, I try to check if there's firmware every day. Um, I use LVFS on Linux uh, to do that. On Microsoft, for example, some of that is built into Windows Update. Um, so it should just be part of your regular, you know, regular hygiene on your system. Uh, this question is virtual firmware still firmware, like for VMs and, and such? Yeah, it's a great question. So VMware, as an example, implements much of what I talked about for secure boot and all that stuff in virtualization and can suffer from similar problems and or uh, vulnerabilities as well. Also, I think it was Tyler Robinson was telling me on a, a previous show that you can enable secure boot for your VMs, um, but it's very, very, very difficult to uh, install and maintain. So it absolutely, yes, this, uh, like a virtual version of UEFI uh, exists for your VMs. A yeah, great question. Cool. Uh, I'm going to have you answer this question while doing, I'm going to ask you to multitask. So okay. here's the multitask. Can you bring up the course that you were talking about oh, yeah. at the same time, talk about <laughs> mobile phone firmware? Uh, it is very, uh, different, but the, um, principles are the same for sure. Um, definitely has a secure boot process on your phone. Definitely your phone, for example, cryptographically verifies components inside of firmware, um, so that you can't jailbreak your phone, right? The, the way that Apple is protecting jailbreaking is very similar to the way Intel has implemented boot guard to make sure you're not manipulating the firmware on on all the hardware responsible for your uh, for your system. So uh, similar concepts, but like different technology on the back end yep. as far as I know. Did you bring up the link? Because uh, we're still looking at the question slide. Did. Um, let's see. How do I get that? I got to get that window up there oh it's going it's going all right it's coming it's, it's coming going. you see it all right so it's open security training dot info slash home uh let's see go to the classes yeah so it's p dot os t two dot fi okay 
I think you can just go to ost2.fi or remember to Google search for Open Security Training 2. We'll get you there. And these are the courses. Um, I've heard really good things about the x86-64 assembly class, uh, if you're into that kind of thing. BSD Bandit came on the show, spoke very highly of that class, so that that's on my uh, next on my list. Um, let's see, where is the U? Oh, here we go. Architecture 4021 Introductory UEFI. The, the word introductory is probably not the best word to use there (laughs) uh but that that is my cheat that's how i uh came up to speed fairly quickly uh on some of the uefi stuff all right paul that's our time today you got any final words for us uh make sure you update your firmware got it all right everybody thank you so much for joining us on this black hills information security webcast thank you paul for joining us for choosing to come on and share your knowledge with the community here uh we do this every single week next week we have one with Bo, and the week after that we got one with cj and the week after that we got another one so make sure you actually open the emails that we send because we don't send any other emails except emails about webcasts and stuff so they're okay they're safe there's only one link in there and the other link is to unsubscribe so There you go. All right, everybody. If you ever need a red team threat hunt, pen test, active sock, you know where to find us. And uh, hopefully if you sign up for the zine, you'll get those soon. That's it for us. Ryan, kill it with fire. Kill it, Ryan. Kill it. Kill it.